Good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to be with you all virtually today for the kickoff of our spring edition of the WL Mellon Speaker Series. This annual series is a long-standing tradition at Tepper. It was started in 2006. The WL Mellon Speaker Series was designed to give students the opportunity to interact with global leaders, CEOs, and management experts. I am pleased we're able to continue offering this enriching experience virtually to our students and that we can now expand our audience to alumni in this remote format. It is now my honor to introduce you to our guest of honor. Gonjan Kedia is vice chair of US Bank Wealth Management and Investment Services and a member of the US Bank Managing Committee, its senior most leadership group. Prior to joining US Bank in 2016, Ganjan held leadership positions at State Street Financial in Boston, where she served as executive vice president and led the investment servicing business in the Americas. BNY Mellon, where she was head of global product management and McKinsey and Company, where she was a partner and a core leader of the financial services practice. She brings more than 27 years of financial services experience in her role. Gonchen holds an MBA with distinction from Carnegie Mellon University and a bachelor's degree in engineering with distinction from the Delhi School of Engineering. Gunjan was named to American Bankers Most Powerful Women in Finance in 2018, 2019, and 2020 list. And she is the recipient of the 2018 Tepper School Alumni Achievement Award. Ganjan is active in the community and serves as board, board members for the Board of Business Advisories right here at the Tepper School of Business, Vice Chair for the Board of the American Red Cross of Massachusetts, Board Member for the US Bank Foundation, Board Member for Junior Achievement, and Co-Chair of the US Bank Women Business Resource Group. Genjan, welcome and thank you for being here today. We're proud to count you among our business school alumni. The students have prepared a variety of questions from you to discuss. I'm looking forward to listening to your remarks. I will now turn it over to Nandita Jaya, MBA 21. Vice President of the Tepper Women in Business Club to start the moderated conversation. A very warm welcome to this chapter of WLM and Speaker Series. It's my utmost pleasure to be the medium of conversation between myself, you, and all of our attendees who are here who comprise not only our current students, but also alumni, as well as our staff member. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It feels like coming home, honestly, and Isabel. Thank you for the very warm introduction and we are delighted to have you here. It's not been so long that I can't say welcome to you as well. Before we begin our conversation, I would just want to share um, some of the housekeeping items. Um, I want to share with the audience the structure of our conversation today. We'll start with around 20 to 25 minutes of uh, conversation with Gunjan where we understand about her personal and professional journey. We'll try to dig into some detail this will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A session that will be hosted by our in-house expert, the Associate Professor for Financial Economics, Professor Chris Telmer. So for the audience, please keep sending us your questions through the Q&A box. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we'll try to bring them to the conversation table as soon as possible. And we'll try to address as many of them as possible. Also a quick note, please note that this session is being recorded. So with that, officially bringing our conversation to the table, Ganjan, 
I understand that it will be very difficult to set context of your 27 years of career in front of our audience, probably like next 20 to 25 minutes. But if I have to start, I would mention, I saw one of your webinar, one of your conversations where you mentioned explicitly that the more senior you get, the less opaque it gets to know exactly how to succeed. So I guess to begin, my question is that in this long and very successful journey, I would say, how have your goals or the runs of your success ladder changed over the years? Uh, just to give you some sense of at least my mindset shifts as I have um, sort of spanned these 27 years. When I graduated from um, engineering, I can tell you I remember the time when I got the phone call from Carnegie Mellon that I had been admitted. And I was literally standing at the bottom of the steps I had come back from somewhere. And at that point, it felt like I could not achieve more success than that minute. You know, it was a prestigious program and I had been admitted to something that just uh, made all my friends and family suddenly respect me. And I mentioned this to you because um, you do sort of, your resume is all about the peaks that you achieve in your life, which happen sporadically, but what you remember most about your career is sort of the stuff that happens in between that gets you to what makes the bullet points in your resume. So what I meant, you know, what I meant by saying it gets a little bit less clear, um, the more senior you get is the job is not um, uh, specific to a role, it's not specific to a time or a description. A lot of leadership is really about watching what's happening and helping your teams and yourself pivot to the right set of actions that we need to do. So the certainty that you'll be spending time on a certain thing just is not something you, you, you live with. You know, in early parts of my career, a lot of my career progression I measured by, I would say milestones, if that's a word, you know, did you become a partner? Did you get promoted? You know, how many people work for you? You know, how big is your budget? You know, there are lots of uh, things you can measure in terms of what is the job you're doing. And then at some point it slips and turns the other way to say, what are you doing with the job you have? You know, what are you accomplishing? Whose lives are you impacting? Are you creating an environment that's fun and exciting for your employees? Are they able to realize their potential because they are part of your team? So it does shift a little bit and it requires a little bit of a different mindset and a little bit of a different skill set. Thank you for asking. Well, and um, that sets a lot, lot of context. Like when we begin, indeed, um, the career milestones, the timestamps are the ones that matter, but it feels like it's growing more and more profound as you're going higher up in the ladder. So if I go a bit deep into that, um, you might have had certain type of transferable skill sets, probably after CMU or what your job taught you on the way. What would you say were your most transferable skill sets that helped you make this transition? Every skill is uh, transferable from, for, from every job to every job. And I do believe that there's nothing you leave behind. You may not be actively using a certain knowledge area or a certain type of thing that day, but every skill that you learn will be a very valuable part of your portfolio. But if you think about an average career journey, it has three very specific phases. You know, the phase one is the doing phase where you tend to be an individual contributor or a leader of a small team and success is defined as the tasks that you deliver on or the projects that you get done or the, the presentations that you were supposed to make uh, the second phase of your career is management of other people's tasks. And then the third is leadership. So, so think about the skills, not, not only in terms of whether they're transferable, but also how they build on each other. Management in my mind, or the first time management skill is probably the hardest transition we see people make. That's why organizations tend to be these, these pyramids because there's so many people who can do the work and then it's a completely different set of skills when you need to, in a truly motivating manner, organize 
and lead other people's works. You know, done well, that's about delegation, that's about cultivation, that's about motivation, that's about the project management. Done poorly, it can be about um, micromanaging or trying to do everybody's work. And all of us go through that journey of trying to not start well as a manager. So I would say, think very differently about the skills that are important in doing the work and what will become important in managing the work. And then when you start to lead, you have the luxury of having a lot of people who can organize the work quite effectively on your teams. And then your role and contribution and mindset or skills as you call it, is very much about where should we all be heading? What's the culture that you should be creating? Are the right people in the right roles? Are the guardrails of risk management integrity in place? So think a little bit about context setting for a lot of people to do high quality work without making mistakes because that's the vibe that you're creating. So those are in my mind the big transitions of skills that happen through your career and you build from one place to another and one company to another. That sets me uh, There's a lot to be done and of course there will be a lot to be done. There's a lot to be understood. Um, digging a bit deep into that, how did you figure out like your path? As in, if I have to ask you that if you can share about a time that influenced you the most in trying to set your thought process in this entire growth, what would be the times when that influenced you the most in your career? Well, I'll tell you, when you look backwards to describe your career, you can create a pattern that makes you feel very insightful, right? Because hindsight is, is, is very wise. That's really not how careers build. So just to give you like, how did my career build? I was um, like many teenagers, completely confused about what to study with undergrad. I decided to do engineering because I was a smart girl. And honestly, a lot of my family in India, I was a young woman growing up in the eighties in Delhi. And a lot of my family told me girls don't do engineering. So I just had to do engineering. <laughs> just to be countercultural. So it's not a great motivation to choose an undergrad, but that was fine. It was my motivation. I wanted to prove to myself that I could do something. And it was a hard um, program for a woman. I mean, at that time, we had to do a lot of practical work. Like you had to weld, you had to do foundry, you had to do blacksmithy. And, you know, we, we were not, um, uh, we were only eight of us in our class. So it was a very good experience for me because it was so different from what you would have expected out of the undergrad. Um, then my father came to the World Bank in Washington DC and I had the luxury of getting a degree in the US, which I never thought I would have that luxury. But here I was and I got into Carnegie Mellon, which was really my privilege and showed up here. Um, and that was a completely new transition because it was a completely new society. You, you didn't know um, how things worked, how people uh, thought. And so that was its own adventure. And I got out of um, uh, uh, MBA and got into consulting again because I didn't know what I wanted to do and consulting left the options open the longest. I was a very successful consultant. I could have stayed as a consultant for a long time, but I had my first uh, son. And within six months, I was a partner at McKinsey at the time. And you fly around everywhere because your teams are in all different cities. And it was very clear to me that that's not a trade off I wanted to make. I wanted to see Ashwin, my older son. You know, at this point, he's 18 and he does not want to see me at all. But at that point, when he was a baby, it was important for me to be around. So it was a very easy decision to go to banking. And then, you know, we decided to, my husband was growing a software company at the time. We wanted to be in Boston for some time. So we showed up there. It's a long story to say careers are not built by one sort of giant. You live your life. Sometimes it's about children. Sometimes it's about supporting your um, husband's career. Sometimes it's about, I'm just bored. I want to do something else. Let's move to a new city. And eventually your career sort of comes along is, is how my path has gone. So I, I hope that uh, gives you some sense of how things connect and maybe there are some people who have a more premeditated sort of path forward. But for me, it was um, just try to have fun and live a life and 
live a rich life that you're not going to be regretful for afterwards and let the career fall into place. You did exactly what I was trying to do, I would say, that summarize, I don't know how we can, but summarize those 27 years and actually give a context for the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was, uh, that was vast. That was very deep. Um, digging a bit, Ninjan, you mentioned that um, your, by the way, your foundry and all of those experiences that very well relate with me because I myself am an engineering undergrad and I did all of those lab works in my undergrad as well. Uh, coming from there, coming as an international student, I would say that um, I would want to ask personally, how was the experience for you? We have a lot of diversity here in CMU and a lot of people experience that shift in terms of uh, their exposure. So what would your, what would you say about your personal experience and what would you have like two words to give to our international community here who are either studying right now or are trying to start their post graduation career? Well, I'll tell you um, my first impression when I was landing in Washington DC, this is where I flew and was, you know, just uh, my, my thought was everything is really clean. And that's really about how profound uh, my first impression of the country is. Mm -hmm. So it is harder when you are operating in an environment that is quite um, uh, different from where you've come from. But on the flip side, you also get forgiven for what you don't know. It's a very generous country. It's a very generous culture. Uh, and I know there's a lot of political debates that go on in America around whether we are friendly as a country or not, and whether we are welcoming of immigrants. And I will tell you, as an immigrant myself, it's a very welcoming culture. I was very embarrassed about my accent, but nobody else really was embarrassed about my accent because that's sort of what you are about. So one thing I would say to all the international students is you might feel like you're different and that's a big deal but people around you might be quite welcoming and forgiving of that. So give yourself some grace and forgiveness too, and just be yourself because uh, that's the only person you really can be. And um, have, have the confidence that in every way, people who seem to be sort of homogeneous or the majority have their own differences. Many of them are, um, showing up to an advanced education for the first time. Many of them have never left their hometown. So there are stories behind everyone and yours is one interesting story. So believe that about yourself. And then learn very quickly. That's the other thing that I would say is that there are some things that you just really need to learn. Like if you have never used Zoom before, which I had not before this year just learned to use it because that's how the society works. So um, there are some practical things that you learn very quickly. Get some friends who help you with the unspoken things about a society. That was one big thing that helped me. You know, the school gives you a lot of framework for your grades, what you need to study, what are the requirements, but who tells you how to eat in a professional setting? who tells you how to talk about sports teams in an interview. You know, these are the type of what I call more subtle things about fitting into a society that only your friends can teach you. So very quickly having a network of friends that are quite different from you uh, will be an important aspect of assimilating quickly too. Now this will be true of international students coming to Tepper, but it will also be true of you joining a new company or trying to do board work in a not-for-profit, which is completely different from what you're used to. So if you develop a habit of learning quickly, asking questions, having a group of people who help you, I think you will assimilate wherever you go. I would say probably core to diversity. Just try to fit in and people accept. Perfect. Um, and on a similar note, because um, with the conversation of diversity, I know that we just had Black History Month last month, and this month is the starting of Women's History Month. So in that respect, I would um, want to understand that have there been like any challenges that you had to overcome in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, either by promoting these values at your firm or personally? My experience with diversity was that um, it was an amplifier of all things wrong and all things right. So what do I mean by that? 
throughout my career, when I did something well, I sometimes felt I got extraordinary kudos for it because of the context of not being from this country, being a woman, being a person of color, not the same religion, short, long hair, like whatever people perceive differences as being. So you get more credit for the successes. You're also written off more if you don't make your presence felt. It's very easy for a diverse person to sort of melt into the background a little bit where people appreciate your presence but don't ever think of your voice as being the voice that should be most listened to. So in that context, what I got, um, uh, the wisdom I gained was to first make my presence felt somewhat unapologetically. So instead of waiting to be asked, you speak up, instead of being defensive about the fact that your opinions are different, you remain confident about they are different because that's the point of having different opinions in the room. And at the same time, um, making sure that you don't have blind spots just because there are some things that you are not growing up with. Like how do you build relationships with somebody who might be, you know, when I was a young partner at McKinsey, I was elected a partner in 2000. I had been in the US for about eight years at the time, which was enough to give you some context, but not enough to truly understand the society. A lot of my clients were very senior executives at Fortune 500 companies. How do you relate to them when you didn't grow up with their backgrounds where your interests might be quite different, where their, you know, their kids might be in college, you were having very young, I was not even, I didn't even have children at the time. So it comes down to not letting your diversity be a barrier. And what was, how did I connect with people? It's because I took interest in their business. And I had something to say about how they could perform their businesses better. So I would just say, if you're a diverse person, it is just really becomes a matter of what's the bridge that will make you and somebody who has a different background from you connect. And there's always a reason to find something to connect. Uh, keeping in that spirit of finding that fit, finding that connection either with the people or their thought process or even with a company. Um, a lot of us are trying to understand how to find our long-term fit with the company that we are trying to work for. So how would you suggest that we navigate um, that problem statement? Like how to fit, find a company that's the right long-term fit? You know, to be honest, you can do all the research in the world, but in the end, the chemistry is with the person you're going to work with. So, you know, the role of a manager who's hiring you is very important in, in how you make decisions because they are the personal face of the, um, the, the company you are joining. But in practical terms, I think the health of a company is an important element. The integrity of the company is an important element. I think you want to ask some questions around who are the type of people who work in the company, who succeed at the company. If you look at the proxy statement of a company and you see everybody who comes from one college or one set of backgrounds and they're not just the way they look, but their backgrounds are exactly the same. You want to ask yourself, or you ask your recruits some more questions on whether the company is a diverse company or not. You do want to ask if they are doing their bit in terms of helping our communities. You want to ask if people get moved around and their careers developed. So these are some sort of practical due diligence questions that you can ask about the company. Here's my personal plug though. If all of you keep choosing companies that are just like you, then every company will be homogeneous. There'll be a bunch of immigrant companies. There'll be a bunch of white companies. There'll be a... So I hope some of you have personal courage and wade into companies that are not like you because that's how you will change the culture. I have worked in largely very homogeneous companies because the most interesting companies to me in the early 90s didn't have a lot of diversity. But here I am. So because of me, now there's a lot of diversity in the company. So I would just say, 
is some of it is you finding companies that fit you and some of it is you changing the companies to be what you need them to be and have confidence that your voices matter to us you uh, the new generation of talent that is coming in is different they demand different things out of leaders and that's very healthy and uh, don't be afraid of wading into companies that you don't think are exactly right for you make them work for you perfect amazing um now moving slightly to a lighter note and at this point again uh, to the audience i would want to highlight that um we already have a lot of questions coming in please use this time to drop your questions in the q and a box and we'll try to move to the q and a section and try to cover as many of them as possible pretty soon one does that very quickly i want to understand that has anything changed post covid well you get intense periods and you get easier periods in your career that's just the nature of life you know we were working very intensely when covid first hit as a leadership team we were meeting at 7:30 in the morning 7 days a week and sometimes more because there were so many decisions to make there was so much anxiety among our um our, our colleagues it was very important to be out in front and make sure that we were taking care of people's personal situations listening to what is going on in in each right so we were working hard as a leadership team and then during summer it sort of settled into a different routine when you could take a breath and think again about sort of work so i do think that you have to think about it as as phases so give yourself permission to also take a breath when you don't have an intense phase but you know careers are like marathon i mean if you're struggling right now with your career you should you should think about what's going to happen 10 years from now so it is like a marathon you got to pace yourself there's always tomorrow almost no setback at any time is the end of a career and that is an important thing for you to understand you know uh i i sometimes listen to my my son you know when they lose a science bowl competition he comes and it's like the end of the world for him and from my perspective it's the start of a journey of getting used to losing learning from it dusting off and then becoming better the next time you compete so remember um careers are like marathon if you burn yourself out this early with anxiety and grief and like disproportionate reaction to not getting a job or not getting a promotion or a failure or a project that doesn't go wrong just have to tell yourself there'll be another project to succeed or fail in tomorrow and almost nothing is sort of set in stone when you, when you're building in fact i will tell you uh when i look at um, candidates for really senior jobs now when we are evaluating very big roles uh, presidents of big businesses we do look at whether their journey has been too comfortable because that's not a great um uh, that's not a great resume for a leader to have what you want to see is enough sort of setbacks enough crises enough battle scars as we call it to give you confidence that you are you have a leader here who's not going to implode the first time something bad happens so i know it's a very contrary to what most people think because the way social media describes people are all the high points of your career here was the promotion here the board roles here and people forget that a lot of character and skill is built in the valleys not in the peaks the peaks happen because of lessons learned in the down times of your career so if you just have perspective that this is how careers are built down times are as uh, normal as promotions i think you just feel less burnout you pace yourself more so uh, those are sort of my lessons learned and i have to honestly say i mean maybe we come across as like pressure cooker executive we are not you know we we see movies we read books we travel we have a lot of fun with our children you know we experiment with a lot of martinis as we are trying to our life and work is going on in the side it so so it is it is really a matter of perspective rather than hours of work that create the sense of that burnout i would say that i am happy personally to get a bit of the personal side of the story and realize that 
everywhere there is a human aspect that we probably sometimes we tend to forget. Um, with that, I'm loving how candid uh, this conversation is becoming. I would want to invite Professor Telmer so that we can dive into the Q&A and um, bring more tough questions in. Wonderful to see you again. Uh, nice to see Kunjan you. and I first met um, when uh, she walked into my international finance class uh, a bunch of years ago. So I'm going to take the first question. How much credit do I get for all of your successes from that you know, class? Chris, <laughs> I have to tell you, I don't know if you do still do it, but at that time you used to bring a, a hot off the press news story to start each class of ours. And we would spend <laughs> the first five or six minutes just diagnosing these opaque stories that we didn't understand. And then Chris would tell us why the story was important. So I give you a lot of credit for, <laughs> for uh, connecting the dots. It was one of, one of um, the most fun classes, uh, which I know you know. I don't have mm. to flatter you. You were a very well, successful. Thank you very much. But I, thank you. It's um, a very enjoyable class. Yeah. Um, I still do that. That's one of the things I enjoy most about teaching. Um, so I've got a... Uh, a lot of questions, more than we have time for, I'm sorry to say. Um, some questions about um, career development, about your time at Tepper, some questions about, uh, about the wealth management industry. Um, so, and uh, some uh, were, were submitted before, some have shown up in chat. Let, let's start with, uh, with one that has come up in chat about the wealth management industry that I think is uh, particularly apropos given a bunch of uh, things that have happened in the financial services industry in recent years uh, that are related to company culture and, uh, and the effects of that. So the question is basically, how do you as a leader um, build and, uh, and, and so at some level be responsible uh, for company culture? Um, and, uh, um, you know, how do you approach that? You know, in the wealth management industry, it is uh, one of the most important things to think about because we, um, when people do bad things in the wealth management industry, they can take advantage of a lot of folks who trusted you with their dearest dreams. So conduct risk is a very, very important part of um, what you want to do. You know, some part of creating culture is hard guardrails, compliance setups, but the thing that really makes a difference to the culture is what you celebrate and what you talk about and the trade-offs you make visibly. So the first time you, um, you celebrate someone stepping away from a high profit opportunity because it was not right for the client, you create 10 years of commitment to integrity in everybody because these are the stories that get repeated. The first time you let someone get away with bad behaviors because they were a big rainmaker, you destroy a lot of the culture. So one of the things I do is um, in any public speaking in front of my teams, in any financial review, you always want to stop and say thank you to your advisors for keeping their clients real for seeing the face of your mother, your father, your brother, and your son in every client. And I asked them, I said, is this advice you would give to your teenage son? And if not, don't give it to your clients. You have to say it over and over and over again. And your compensation, your promotion decisions have to be very consistent with the culture. You cannot slip up once. People are smart. They can read through words immediately. Such an intangible thing, but such an important thing. And uh, um, let's turn to uh, something about looking back on your, uh, on your Tepper MBA life. Um, people want to know, um, what would you tell your, uh, your, your Tepper MBA self to do differently, uh, given your, uh, your experiences up, up until now? I'm very fond of my time at Tepper. I uh, credit it with um, sort of launching me in a very real way. And what do I mean by that? Um, you know, some part of is the skills and vocabulary you learn, just that makes you credible in your first job, that you will create value day one because you bring something to the table. And um, Tepper in particular is very differentiated you know, Tepper graduates sort of have a level of credibility about hard skills that is still quite unmatched, even with very, very good, good MBA programs. Um, 
but even more important was the was the the character it created in me you know the De- tepper De- as a school didn't encourage a lot of sort of um, uh, personal uh, victimhood there was a lot of swagger to working hard in fact at that point it might have changed but in 1992 we sort of congratulated ourselves from how how terrible the workloads were and how devastatingly hard the exams were but it created sort of a group of people who were not worried about or not uh, 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 not not daunted by hard work or tough challenges or taking on things you had no idea if you were going to s- sort it out and that's a very nice character i give a lot of credit to that vibe in in my attitudes about how i take on life you know i was an engineering major and english was not kind of my only language but i was part of the robert barons editorial staff like who would let me write a column but i used to write a column and i got better at writing just because i was able to do that so i would say to all of you at tepper is wade into things that you don't think you can do experience what it feels like to start doing it better just because you have tried to do it better and that confidence will stay with you well beyond any skill that you will learn <laughs> very well said um you know i i think many of those uh um many of much of that culture and that uh, that work ethic uh, that you remember uh, remains i think we have refined it uh, some in some ways for example the when the students get here in the summer now they attend base camp um at, at first we were going to call it boot camp but uh we decided that that yeah we're uh, we're moving along here um so um uh a question about uh, about gamestop we can't have a finance professor talking to a financial services industry leader i guess without talking about that but the questions articulated very well so let me um read it there's been a lot of talk lately about the lionization of the retail investor now uh, do you think this is overblown or does main street have much more to say about the price of an asset compared to uh, t- 10 or 20 years ago the retail investor is very relevant and they have changed our industry in a meaningful way so so i want to first just acknowledge that that it is the lionization of the retail investor is very real where the industry has seen the impact of the retail investor most is how much asset management pricing has come down it's the decision to go into cheap passive etfs rather than expensive active funds which has really been a seismic shift in the industry it is it is um, the financial education at your fingertips and the reason to be active that have been the best parts of the retail lionization this game stop mania is just nuts chris how how's that for 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 an executive trying to understand what is happening with investing uh, investing today so um, is it helpful to have investors do their own research and put their own biases against what kind of companies they want to support perhaps should young investors be doing herd like investing in a single stock i don't think so there is um, investing is a is a source of building your life it's not a gambling instinct what mm-hmm. if you lose money early on in your game stop what you've really done is 30 years from now you will not be able to give your daughter the wedding dress that she really wants and it is important for investors to understand the fullness of what investing is about so i would say it's a very interesting phenomenon i think a lot of people will get really badly burnt yeah. i hope they can afford to get past that and recover with wisdom and um and not lose sort of life savings in yeah. in a like this yeah you know this comes up in finance people's lives all the time the distinction between speculation uh, and investing and it's a, it's a nuanced um distinction and i think you articulated it very well um i'm going to pass it over uh back to nanditya in a minute but let me uh just ask uh one last question that came up at the end here uh um what's something that students may be surprised to know uh, about 
life, um, a daily life in the C-suite. It's kind of mysterious, isn't it, to most people? And yeah. uh, uh, it is uh, it is just life for some of us. And uh, so here's, um, uh, you know, here, here's some thoughts I would leave you with all the future C-suite uh, leaders or current C-suite leaders who might be in our audience here is, um, you know, leadership is not a genetic trait. It is sort of a skill learned, uh, you know, a bit of privilege earned by hard work, by humility, by paying attention to what is needed, by never forgetting to learn. Uh, this, this notion that we just know what we know is not right. I have paid a lot of attention to investor behavior with GameStop because it is new to me. And it's different from what I have experienced over time. So uh, the, the life in the C-suite is really one of um, real humility, I would say. You have a fairly strong amount of decision rights over other people's promotions, compensation, career paths, about the experience of your customers, about the benefits that your company will offer. And with that comes an enormous sense of obligation. So most of us are not uh, people with swagger and arrogance. Most of us are um, listening, learning, trying to understand how to help people along the way, and very aware of the responsibility we shoulder for a lot of people's livelihoods and a lot of people's hopes and aspirations. So I would leave that with you is that I spend most of my time not counting my dollars and my compensation, but just making sure I'm making sound decisions for today's employees and employees of US Bank 100 years from now. Yeah. So I know that's not a very glamorous answer, but I'm giving you an honest answer about what it feels like. Um, I think it's a really meaningful answer. Uh, my dad was a CEO uh, of a, a large Canadian steel company, and much of what you just said um, sort of describes my recollection, my recollections of growing up uh, in his household. So thank you, Gunjan. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure the next time uh, we do one of these, uh, I'm going to be able to give you a physical uh, uh, rounding uh, bunch of applause, but, uh, but not today. Um, and I'm going to uh, pass it back uh, to Nandita to close things out. Um, thank you very much. Pleasure, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tanur. Thank you for turning this into a candid fireside chat. There was a, there were a lot of interesting questions and interesting discussion going there. And with that, I would also want to thank you, Gunjan. Thank you for being a candid guest today. You gave us a lot of food for thought, um, not just about probably admiring or trying to be an executive, but also how should we think about shaping our career path, writing, right? Starting from wherever we are right now. Before I close the event, before I give my thank you remarks, would you have any closing notes for the audience over here? Anita, you did a really nice job. Thank you. Some part of why the conversation is candid and interesting is because the facilitator asked the right question. I do many of these. So thank you for, for um, sort of the meaningful nature of um, our conversation. It was my pleasure to join the group. And if there are one or two words of wisdom of mine that helps one of you as you make decisions, that would have been very, very worth it for me. I'll just leave you with one thought. Um, simply reflecting on um, the nature, the, the context of what's around us in the news media today, which tends to be quite challenging. And um, it is very possible for a young executive entering the workplace to feel weighed down by the challenges that you perceive to be in front of you. I'm diverse, so I won't get opportunities. I'm the right, I'm not the right politics or the the world is crashing around us. And I will say that one of the best things young leaders do is bring optimism to the workplace and a sense of can-do-ness, a belief system that says there is nothing that can't be resolved if talented people with the right integrity decide to resolve problems. So I hope you never lose that ethos that is so prevalent in schools 
and can be so positively infectious in companies as you make your presence felt. Thank you. Totally our pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, I would also want to extend my thanks to our sponsoring clubs, Alpha Asset Management Club, Graduate Finance Association, Tepper Finance Group, Tepper Women in Business, and South Asian Business Association. You all were instrumental in supporting this chapter today, and thank you for the, all the work that you have done in the background. Thank you, La Lauren and Ashley from the Advancement Office for actually putting this conversation together. If not for you, this wouldn't have been possible. And last but not the least, thank you all the audience members. You were a really nice chatty bunch. I could also see all the question and answers coming. And um, we know that we didn't get to all of it, but I hope that this uh, conversation was very interesting for you and certainly gave you uh, things to think about. Um, with that, I would want to drop a quick plug for the next in line from the WL Mellon Speaker Series. That's with Amit K. Sajdev, Executive Vice President and Chief Patient Officer at Vertex Pharmaceuticals that will be hosted on March 31st. Please check it out. And if that's of interest to you, please register. And I'm sure it will be a similarly exciting event. With that, I'd want to close the webinar. Thank you all for being here. And we hope that all of you have a great day ahead. <laughs>